My name is Dmitry. I'm a software engineer and a Python and C++ mentor. This is the third video in a series that I'm making on the topic of defining the strict JSON config schemas in Python using Pydantic V2. So um, if you haven't watched the first and second video in the series, I would highly advise you to check out, check out them first to get you up to speed for what we're going to be talking about in this one. Um, so assuming you have seen them, uh, I'll just quickly remind ourselves where we left off so that I can continue. So the premise is that you and I are creating a startup that is going to deliver a VPN solution to the market. Every such VPN solution requires a VPN client that your end users are going to actually run on their uh, machines to connect to your network. Uh, so we're trying to implement such a VPN client here in Python. And uh, we have already discovered that such an application is probably going to need some sort of a config. So, so far, our config is actually the only thing it has is destination server and destination port. And uh, we have been a kind of exploring the ways to implement such an application. So on the left, we have um, some Python code that implements a naive approach, uh, naive approach to actually ingesting such a, a JSON config into our application and using values uh, specified in that config. So here we just read a JSON config, uh, re receive a Python dictionary from that JSON and just use it directly. And on the right, uh, so in the first video, I have showcased some of the issues that arise from such approach. And then in the second video, I have shown how you can um, fix those issues using Pydantic to parse your config and use the models that uh, Pydantic provides to actually uh, write your, the rest of your code and avoid those issues. So now I'd like to, uh, going further, I would like to introduce you to some other features of Pydantic that I find very powerful and very useful. And to do that, I'm gonna stick to the same kind of approach where I show you a problem, explain it to you, and then explain how we can solve it with Pydantic. Um, so now I'm gonna set some ground for further exploration of Pydantic. Stick with me. Um, now I'm gonna uh, actually switch over to my second window in Tmux and show you a different piece of code. So here, um, the story goes as follows. So every VPN client, as you probably know, uses some sort of uh, encryption. And our VPN client so far just has the destination server and port uh, specified. But uh, to have any sort of encryption going on, you have to, well, use one of the encryption protocols, encryption methods, and you have to uh, uh, configure them correctly. Um, I'm not going to bother ourselves with like any of the details of real encryption protocols that are used in practice. So I propose we'll just uh, come up with something fictional just to showcase you what I'm talking about. Um, so let's say we have two encryption methods, uh, crypt foo, that is going to require a password, and crypt bar, that is going to require a key. Now, what I have on the left here is a piece of Python code that is actually uh, sort of a development of the naive approach that we have uh, looked at previously, uh, that tries to introduce encryption uh, parameters into that code. So to highlight the differences from what we had before, uh, in the main function, we still have reading from JSON. We still instantiate the VPN client, and we just pass everything that we've got from the JSON config into the client. And so the new, three new lines here are method, password, and key. Uh, bear in mind, pay attention to the fact that uh, this line will not work if method is not present in the config, whereas those two uh, will work if any of the password or key are not present in the config. Uh, the, reason, the reason being is that uh, since we, like, we don't check what the method is, so we don't know if the password is supposed to be present or not, and same goes for key. And then we pass all of that to the VPN client. Uh, VPN client receives it in the init method. 
And here in its init method, it just stores everything and then prints everything that it has received. Um, so that, that looks pretty simple. Uh, we are obviously leaving out most of the implementation of such a thing uh, in, in those three dots and the do stuff function. But yeah, it's got everything we need to proceed. Now, um, I propose we just run this on some configs that I have prepared and see how it works and then discuss some of the issues that this approach has. Um, so we can actually run this appy on a config that I have prepared. So this, and let me show you the config itself so that we understand what we talk about. Um, here, as you can see in the config, it specifies the server and the port. And then we try to use the method crypt foo and specify a password for it, which is completely correct. So that's a, a valid config that should work. And we can see that uh, when it, it, it has been propagated to the VPN client correctly. So the destination server and port are correct. The method is correct. The password is there and the key is none, but that is fine because uh, we're using crypt foo that requires a password, doesn't require a key. Uh, as opposed to using crypt bar, which would do the opposite. So that's good. Now let's um, let's take a look at the second uh, config uh, that I have prepared. This is actually going to be quite similar to the one we've already seen, but it's going to use crypt bar and specify the key and not the password. So again, we can kind of run this. And yes, on the second config and see that everything worked wonderfully. Uh, destination server and port has, have been uh, specified correctly. Method is crypt bar, just like we wanted to. Password is none, which is expected because crypt bar doesn't require a password. It requires a key and the key is set. Uh, so this should work as well. Now, although this might seem good, uh, there are actually a couple of issues, I know of two, uh, with this piece of code that uh, might want some attention from us. So one of them is going to be more straightforward. Uh, let's take a look at this dict bad config that I have prepared. It's probably quite apparent why this config is bad, because it tries to use crypt foo, but then it doesn't specify a password and crypt foo requires a password so that's not gonna fly um but let's try to run with this config and see what happens so the bad config here we go and so destination server and port are correct a uh, method is filled out correctly and the rest is filled out correctly according to the config the real problem here is that the config itself is broken and uh, uh, since it's broken, this is not going to work, but we have not detected that. And this is quite bad because, uh, don't get me wrong, at some point, this code would have broken uh, with that broken config because there's no way you can use script foo without a password. So something is going to break, right? Your connection is probably not going to connect. And yeah, uh, but there are a couple of issues with that. First of all, that did not happen right away even though we clearly have everything we need to, to be able to tell that this config is not gonna work. We just know this is not supposed to happen and password is supposed to be filled out for crypt foo, but we don't enforce it. So we allow it to continue to execute. And second of all, even when it does fail, uh, which might happen anytime later, uh, when it does fail, it might not necessarily tell us in clear terms what is exactly wrong. So imagine finding yourself configuring this application that we've got here, then spending, let's say, five minutes of retrying to connect to, to the server and then just giving up saying, oh, I can't connect because apparently the password is wrong because we haven't specified it. But yeah, the application is just in no way telling user what is missing. And that is what I, what I think is a bad issue and bad problem uh, about this. Now, the second type of issue is actually a bit more subtle and less straightforward in terms of like the impact that it has, but it's still quite important for any production grade code base that is probably going to be quite large. So let's take a look at this confusing config that I've got here. 
Um, so at first, I, I can't say that this config is bad or broken uh, because it actually does specify everything that we would need to perform a successful connection. It does have the server, the port, the method crypt foo, and crypt foo requires a password, and we do specify a password, so that's good. But then it also has this extra key that is actually not being used in any way because crypt foo doesn't require a key, but we are still allowed to specify it. Um, and I would argue that this is quite bad. Why? Well, there's a couple of reasons, and the, the, the main reason being that this is confusing. So let me give you a couple of examples to showcase why that would be bad. So uh, there's a couple of types of users of this application. So like the let's let's consider the end users, right? So let's say you're an end user and you're trying to use our application. Now, uh, probably when the the application will be mature, it's going to have even more values in its config, and uh, when the config grows large it is going to be genuinely hard to write a correct config for the application to work. So what the end users tend to do, and which is quite reasonable to do, is to go ahead to stay Stack Overflow or some other place on the internet and try to find some other people's configs and attempt to run this thing to kind of see what has succeeded and what has not and what they would need to replace in, in the working solution of some other guy uh to make their use case work and so they go to stack overflow and then they see that someone posted this config that we've got here well the thing is this config did work for whoever wrote it but the key is really not necessary here and maybe they even knew that it wasn't necessary here but the the our end user who found this information in stack overflow is not going to know that the key is not necessary so they will think that they need to specify both the password and the key. And this is just false, right? This is wrong information. So we're kind of misleading our users into thinking they need this key, even though they don't. And I would argue this is quite bad because they're gonna try to look up, oh, how do I get this key? Because it's probably gonna need to be generated in some way, but they'll, probably find out that there's no way to generate a key that would work with CryptFoo because CryptFoo doesn't need a key. <laughs> so this confusion can really be, can, yeah, frustrating for the user. Um, yeah, and this is definitely not something we want for our application. Now, the second type of users that I would like to touch on is actually developers. So let's say there's a junior developer joining your team that works on this VPN client solution. Um, this guy, uh, you assign him some key, uh, key uh, some ticket to work on, and he's going to go ahead and try to complete it, but he'll ne first need to kind of read through the code and understand what it's doing to do anything meaningful. Now, one of the things you can do when reading the code and trying to understand what it does is uh, pr probably like every mature project has like some sort of unit tests. And those unit tests are actually great examples of how you can run your application written by users or rather by developers who have actually developed the thing and know how it's supposed to be used. So it's a really good idea to go ahead and take a look at those configs to see what you should be doing, what you should not be doing, and yeah, what is a valid config after all. And again, it may very well be that our junior developer goes ahead and one of the configs that they find is going to be this, which has this key property that is really not required. The test is going to pass, right? Because key is just not going to be effective in any way. It might have might as well been uh, missing. But since it's not missing, since it's actually present, um, our junior developer is going to think, oh, I probably need to specify this. Then they're going to go ahead, read the code, and the code is going to be telling another story. And yeah, this will really only create confusion for our junior developer, and it'll, it'll take him longer to actually figure out what is right and what is wrong. 
So yeah, uh, those are the two reasons why uh, this confusing config can be really bad. Um, yeah, and ex especially this issue is especially bad because it's it can be fixed quite easily uh, using Pydantic, which I'm going to be talking about in the next video in this series. So until then, stay tuned.